Good afternoon. Great video, doctor. So let me introduce myself. I'm Maurice Smith. I'm the president of Healthcare Service Corporation. Many of you know it as Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Illinois. I'm also a proud alumnus of Roosevelt University and a trustee, and I'm honored to be here today. Thank you for taking your time out of your day. I want to welcome you to a discussion today about a very important matter near and dear to my heart, but also so many of us in Chicago. It's about violence reduction in Chicago. As we know, this is a critical issue for many Chicagoans directly, and it's a critical issue for our city, our state, our country. It's holding us, many of us, back from reaching our fullest potential. In fact, in healthcare, healthcare, the access itself only accounts for about 20% of the overall health outcomes, only about 20%. What really makes a difference is your environment, what we call social determinants of health. Things like transportation, healthy food, and safe neighborhoods. Violence in Chicago often makes headlines across the country, but the grassroots organizations doing the important work to prevent it, prevent violence from occurring, is often left out of the conversation. Today, we're gonna to talk about that. As a company committed to improving the health of local communities, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Illinois has funded many local nonprofits. Some are in the room today. Um, and from a public health perspective, this is one of the things that's number one on our agenda. We also believe in lifting the communities we serve with programs like the Blue Door Neighborhood Center that you may have heard about that opened up in the West Pullman area that we're very proud of. Proud of. But also by not only fighting uh, violence through what was called classic measures, but more about economic stimulus. We're adding over 500 jobs in the Morgan Park neighborhood of the city, and we're very proud of that. The leaders on this stage today have taken a call to action to create networks of violence prevention and peace building. Peace building, very important. We thank them for their expertise in this fight to eliminate violence. We also want to thank President Ali, Nancy Stevenson, and the Stevenson Center, and especially the Roosevelt staff for organizing this major event. At this time, I want to introduce you to Nancy Stevenson, as well as today's moderator, Von Bryant, Director of Community Partnerings for Peace. Thank you and enjoy today's discussion. Nancy, could you come up and join me? Uh, before this conference started, Mr. Smith and I was, uh, had a conversation, and he said that he knew the streets and alleys of almost all of the communities in Chicago. That's pretty impressive. Uh, and he was born and raised in Mississippi, is that right? And so he's come here and learned all about the good things about Chicago. Um, thank you, Mr. Smith, for that wonderful introduction of your career and of this program, um, and for helping to fund the, the whole Dream Conference, plus the Center for the Institute for Nonviolence Chicago, which is the organizer helper that got the Stevenson Center involved here. The Stevenson Center hosts programs on public policy with the intent of providing information on challenges to democratic systems of government, and it aims to engage people in dialogue and therefore create the ability to take part in the solutions to those challenges. We have put papers on, uh, out for all of you to see some samples of the wide variety of issues that we cover. I want to acknowledge here our son, Warwick Stevenson, who does much of the work for the Stevenson Center, and the wonderful volunteers who are represented here, volunteers and supporters of the center who are sitting in the front row, and, uh, and some colleagues, or one colleague at least, from a training in the Austin neighborhood uh, on nonviolence techniques. Uh, we had a three-day training at the Institute. So welcome to all those special friends and uh, to all of you who've joined this important topic today. 
The Stevenson Center is grateful for Roosevelt's president, Malik Zaidi. Uh, he calls himself Ali to everybody. Um, but uh, he gave us an invitation to put together a panel for this, uh, for this conference. And combating racism and poverty, bringing peace to communities, are essentials of the American dream. Roosevelt University has provided an opportunity today to share important community work on breaking the cycle of violence in Chicago. The strength of Chicago is determined by the condition in all of our 77 communities, the quality of our schools, our health services, our job opportunities, affordable housing, recreation and safety from gun and other forms of violence. All are essentials for all of our neighborhoods. Today, these panelists will explore a variety of ways in which current collaboration is providing training, jobs, counseling to perpetrators and victims alike, community services, games for children and youth, a variety of ways to help communities thrive and prosper. Please note, uh, Commander Ernest Cato of the 15th Police District, which covers the Austin community, is part of this collaboration, Community Policing at Work. To paraphrase Rebecca Clark, when we ignore race and violence, it doesn't go away. We must confront the truth and support those who fight for peace and community justice. The organizations represented by these panelists work every day to overcome racism and bring peace to our least served communities. We are grateful to them and all of their collaborators for putting their energies, skills, lives on the line every night and day to defend communities and thus all of Chicago. The center also gives special thanks to Tara Dabney uh, for her passion for these causes and for pulling this panel together. Now, Mr. Moderator Vaughn Bryant, the program is up to you and they'll have to march in. Thank you so much. There's Vaughn Bryant. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, I love having this conversation, and uh, I like being a moderator sometimes. Um, so one of the rules is I, I'm not going to have everybody answer every single question, uh, but I think there's a different perspective people can put on the same question sometimes. Um, but we'll start with introductions. I'm Vaughn Bryan, Executive Director. Metropolitan Peace Initiatives. I uh, manage the Communities Partnering for Peace program for the city of Chicago. Um, my name is Miguel Angel Cambrai. I work with Ready Chicago um, at Heartland Alliance. Um, I'm the Director of Career Pathways for Ready Chicago, and my primary role is to sort of engage partnerships um, to sort of invest into the population that we're trying to serve. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rick Estrada. I'm President and CEO of Metropolitan Family Services. Good afternoon. My name is Ernest Cato. I'm the commander of the 15th District Chicago Police Department of the proud Austin neighborhood. Good afternoon. Tending for us. Uh, yeah. Please sit in. But uh, I'm the executive director of the Institute for Nonviolence in Chicago, which works in Austin, West Garfield, and back of the yard, and our farming partners with community partners for peace. Excellent. So, um, one of the things we want to do to kind of set some context is to talk about what happened in other cities to reduce violence. And the different people on the panel have uh, have knowledge about different cities. So, I'm going to start with Miguel to talk about uh, your knowledge about what happened in Philadelphia and Oakland. So, part of the experience that we, in learning of best practices in both out of Philadelphia and Oakland is understanding how to engage. Um, neighborhoods, participants, workforce, and, and cities to sort of work together to address pervasive gun violence. So Red Chicago was born from um, those sort of initiatives on a national level. 
to inform us in Chicago of how to integrate through collaborative partnerships that involve various stakeholders in addressing pervasive gun violence um, in a city like Chicago. And Tenny, if you can talk about uh, Boston and LA and your knowledge about what they did just high level. So in, in Boston, like any other cities in the late 80s and early 90s, we had the crack epidemic. We had the end of a cycle of many people leaving neighborhoods and as well as factories leaving, so unemployment. And it was an explosion of violence. And we stumbled into partnering between law enforcement, probation, outreach workers, and clergy, really out of failure. None of those groups liked each other. But we were all meeting at funerals, so we kind of, out of necessity, we started working together. Uh, some people call it a Boston miracle. It still is a great example of violence reduction. Some of this model then was replicated in other places. The deputy mayor now of Chicago for violence reduction, uh, Susan Lee, is a proud example uh, with who worked on LA. If it's possible in LA, it's possible everywhere. Uh, we took that model then in Providence, Rhode Island, a very progressive new chief after previous mayor went to jail, similar issues you're familiar with, and really reformed what was going on there to the point it's a smaller place, but was very, very poor. Then in 2016, there was zero gang homicide. So this model works uh, in many other places. I think we're trying to structure together now something that will work for Chicago. And Commander Cato, from a police perspective, when you think about cities that have had like a similarly situated like New York and LA, what from a police perspective did the police do to reduce violence uh, in those cities? Well, T, I have been fortunate to go to go other cities. One of the biggest things is collaboration with community organizations and also empowering the communities to, to assist the police department. Uh, another issue is technology. Technology has played a huge role in policing communities. We've been fortunate that we uh, actually have a few uh, rooms in, our, in the department right now where we're doing our spot shotters, our uh, pod missions, which is video. But I think the most important part of it is the collaborations with community workers and uh, outreach workers. Excellent. So, Rick, if you could talk about like the history of violence prevention work, you know, kind of going back to Irv Spurgle in Chicago, and talk about how we got to the point we are today. Wow, that's a, that's a, could be a long story. I'll just be as brief as possible. You know, outreach work, community-based outreach work is not new in this city. It didn't start in LA or Boston, those places. We've been doing it here for about 100 years, if not uh, longer than that. I know that uh, I'll, I'll just begin from around the 1970s, 80s, and into the 90s. Uh, among the leading thinkers of that work was a guy named Irving Spurgle out of the University of Chicago that created uh, the street outreach model. Uh, he worked uh, extensively with the Department of Justice and with other universities to create best practices around uh, outreach. Many of the workers that are active today have come from that model. That model, I think some people might take offense to this, but I think it evolved uh, and took some turns. Then Gary Slumpkin at... Um, you know, uh, cure violence, kind of re kind of configured it and talked about it as a public health approach to violence. Uh, as you know, uh, it was a very successful effort across uh, many parts of the country and parts of the world, and to a certain extent here in Chicago uh, by creating the interrupters and other outreach uh, initiatives. Uh, what I would say about that program is many, many of the people that are working in the organizations that you're going to learn about more today, whether it's uh, our partners through Communities Partner for Peace or Ready Chicago or, or CRED and some of the other programs have come through cure violence initiatives of the past. So for me, it's an evolution uh, that you know started 100 plus years ago. Then you know, there's some, lots of unnamed uh, heroes that have been involved uh, certainly uh, over the 60s and 70s, and then later, in, a, in an effort to professionalize it, Spurgo came to mind, and then other researchers and implementers that we're going to hear about today. So if you could continue on and just kind of talk about how Communities Partnering for Peace came to be, and then we'll go to Ready. After. Sure. Uh, Communities Partnering for Peace, and that's uh, CP4P, really came to be uh, when a couple of things happened here in Chicago. One, uh, Tenny Gross came to town. He was recruited 
by the last uh, city administration to come to the city from Providence and from his work he was doing out there to, to uh, just bring additional thinking uh, to the city around the gang violence reduction uh, efforts. Not that we didn't have lots of good people working on it here, but we wanted additional thinking from a fresh perspective, and they brought, uh, convinced Tenney to leave that uh, important work in life and come here. Quickly, Tenney and uh, the Austin community developed partnerships with uh, other great nonprofits that are part of our um, partnership today, including Breakthrough Urban Ministries and, and others. And we started meeting together and soon realized that we, we could build an initiative rather than a program. We could build a collaboration rather than, again, some isolated one organization-led program. And what has evolved, uh, Vaughn, as you uh, know and Tony knows, is this dynamic group of, at first, nine organizations working together in the nine neighborhoods with the highest incidence of gun violence to, to drive the violence down, um, mostly through partnership and community, and, and uh, equally importantly, with partnerships with the Chicago Police Department and the uh, city of Chicago. And then Ready Chicago was sort of on a parallel track uh, being planned at the same time. Uh, Miguel, if you could kind of talk about how that evolved to where we are today. I don't know about the evolution of, of Ready in collaboration with everyone here. I think I look across this panel, everybody's still a part of Ready. And it's funny because we're at a moment in time in Chicago, um, and I've heard Tony say this before, like th the shift is happening of collaborative efforts. And I think in, in today's age, you can't say you're doing a, a violence intervention initiative without saying collaboration is a part of that. So everybody here on the stage is a part of Ready Chicago, in addition to folks that are not on the stage. And Ready Chicago, as you mentioned, um, as the strategies were happening in 2016 of what do we do different citywide, um, Ready Chicago was sort of sprout from that as well, which is an intense sensitive workforce initiative to look at cognitive behavioral therapy in addition to work skill building and job placement as a part of that. And it's probably the first um, sort of program in the country to do it for two year time frame um, in collaboration with local partners. So the strategy for Ready isn't that there is one institution leading the effort. There's sort of a funding stream that goes through co-collaboration with Heartland Alliance in addition to the pioneering of local agencies at the outreach side and at the workforce development. Side. So, Commander Cato, so given sort of the history of street outreach and different violence prevention initiatives, kind of talk about how the police have evolved in their work in partnership with uh, these organizations. Well, wow, you know, that's a very interesting one because if you think about in the past, the police department has tried in the past to have a relationship with outreach workers, and it didn't work. Early on, it did not work. Uh, and to be totally transparent, I was very apprehensive at the very beginning to have that type of relationship. But what I did, I found a lot of trust in the Institute of uh, Nonviolence with uh, Tenny Gross and other organizations. So after we formed that relationship, and the department is going that way based upon the new administration, they want more collaboration, cooperations with outside organizations. What we learned in the 15th district, we developed a group called the Austin Response Team. We call it an art because it is an art. And on that team, there sits five outside organizations on that team, and Institute sits on that organization, Build sits on that organization, Hope Community Coach, Church, uh, Austin coming together and Stop the Violence. And I'm happy to say, since we formed that organization approximately two years ago, we've seen an incredible reduction in violence. Uh, just at to today's date, we have a 14% decrease in homicides and a 30% decrease in shootings. On top of that, if we go back to 2016, which was our worst year, you know, at this particular, two years later, we're looking at a 56% 50, reduction in person shot and an approximately 30% reduction in homicides. Now, I don't contribute that to just the work of the Chicago Police Department. It's because of the collaborative efforts. One thing I've learned, I could pick any street in the city of Chicago, and I'll tell you right now, I can clean that block up. The problem is, is when the police leave, who's going to sustain it? And what we found, the community organization has had the ability to sustain those blocks. But most importantly, when we identify gang conflicts, we contact our partners from the Institute and say, this is what we have in this particular area. How can you help us? The Institute then takes their resources, their outreach workers. Now, mind you, these workers are probably had caused some of the problems that exist today. Who better to go out there and solve some of these problems? And we've been very fortunate that they have been able to do that. Then we look at our partners who have the ability to reach out to children, which is our foundation. 
which is the most important part of this piece that we need to address. Because too often, we treat them as though they're invisible. We treat gang members as though they're invisible. And guess what? If you treat anything like it's invisible, you're going to get what we're getting today. So today, with the collaborative effort with these community organizations, they've been able to address those issues. So Tenny, so given you're an implementer of both CP4P and Ready, and you have a strong collaboration with the police, kind of talk about it from the practitioner's perspective and all of the different elements in CP4P and Ready and how you guys engage with the police. It's going to come sort of from some humility that outreach alone or us alone uh, won't save it. When I was 23 driving in Dorchester in Boston, I really feel, felt this city is sleeping because of me. That will be defined by psychiatrists as megalomania. Uh, <laughs> and as you fail and you bury people and you see other people's contribution, you come to a place where you enjoy other people, what they do, right? And really, Austin, we chose Austin because it led the city f forever in amount of shootings and homicides. And having the luck to have Commander Cato, having the luck of having the investments of CP4P and, and Rick's and Vaughn's leadership and having the investment of Ready, the fact that outreach, it would take us another 10 years to build a relationship that we sped up through having an opportunity of 18 months employment plus six months, right? So really bringing the, a lot of the problem in our city uh, and acute in Chicago is the disinvestment, right? So this framework here helps we can be a little connector with a finger in the dike, but there's all these things behind it that are bringing our resources. And that is really, so none of us should think we are the solution. We're really one safety net, and now we can connect and be connected to things that are really solving problems for us. I don't know how to solve housing for young people, or so many of them are homeless, but Heartland is working on it hard. MFS is working on mental health. These are resources beyond our reach, but through us we can connect people to solutions. So I'm feeling hopeful, and that is because big and small are working together. So can, can you give us a day in the life of an outreach worker? A day of the life of an outreach worker could be my cell phone going off at 2 in the morning, notified from, from the district that we just had a shooting, or it could be my outreach worker being out saying, Tenny, something is going on there, and I call the commander. We start coordinating response and hospital. Uh, conflicts that usually we are well familiar with, so not always it's a respond and a negative thing. Sometimes the end of life is a lot of maintenance work. Which conflicts are out there? Who are we connected with? Taking someone to get an ID, working with someone making funeral arrangement, calling a commander said the family requested at this funeral some safety. A lot of little moving pieces, courts, advocacy. Uh, and that is, so there's a lot of detail in the work and then some strategy as well. Assessing with the numbers where we have, where are hot spots, where things could erupt, being predictive and proactive. Uh, a lot of that is our work. And having really layers of things. We have outreach, we have case management, victim advocates, community organizers, nonviolence trainers. So a lot of that is keep giving a diet and strengthening what is needed and where, where the resource. We recently had a, a very difficult crew that did not want to deal with us and was giving the command a headache. The guy likes to rap. One of our best outreach workers is a pretty famous producer of rap music. They ended up together in Atlanta, meeting some big shots. We'll do anything. <laughs> I don't care what it takes. If, if someone loves Disneyland, we'll find a way. I'll call Rick, can we go to Disneyland with this guy? Right, <laughs> build relationship. And it's relationship building that you matter, that you care, constantly engaging. We don't allow our people to take no. When, we don't wait when someone is ready. Often in nonprofits, when someone is ready or not, we want to keep doing the Jericho strategy, keep surrounding the walls until they crumble, showing young people we will be consistently there with them. So one of the things that uh, we also borrow from Los Angeles, uh, they have something called the Urban Peace Academy, where they've committed to professionalizing street outreach work uh, in Los Angeles. So. In Chicago, we have what we call the Metropolitan Peace Academy. Um, Rick, if you could kind of talk about uh, the Peace Academy and what we've done with that over the last couple of years. 
Yeah, sure. I think so far you've heard about uh, our individual organization's initiatives, about street outreach, about the police partnership with the work that we're doing. Uh, but in order for us to be assured and for the police partners to be assured that our the outreach workers, the individuals, mostly guys, sometimes I say guys, but they're not all men. Um, so to be assured that the outreach workers will have the confidence of police, the confidence of community, the confidence of our HR teams and our own people at the organizations. We uh, took the model from Los Angeles and created a place where we will train um, the outreach workers uh, with the best available science and best available practice in street outreach work. And some of it uh, is the lived practice that the outreach workers from Tennis Organization and Ready and Heartland and other places uh, have, uh, have lived, and we've developed a curriculum designed by uh, a PhD, African American PhD, taught by originally by three African American PhDs, all of whom have uh, violence uh, involved lives. Um, and, um, and if you would th think about them as they're the professors that created the class, and they're teaching assistants are the experts out there in the field that are doing the outreach work. All of our, of our best of the best outreach workers, the healthiest of the healthiest, the most experienced are the teaching assistants. So now you have a class of let's say 25 uh, new people that are wanting to do this outreach work. Many of them are already employed in outreach work and they go through a 16 week curriculum that is again designed uh, for them and it would include things that we've learned that we learned from Spurgle and Slump Slumpkin and out uh, in Boston and Providence, Oakland, LA, uh, including many topics. Um, but over the course of the 16 weeks, I'll just give you a little uh, highlight of that. They get the history of outreach work. They get, uh, importantly, how to take care of themselves out in the street because they don't go out there with a vest or a weapon. They go out there with their reputation and they try to help build peace and community. So how do you keep yourself safe? How to you keep yourself healthy? Uh, elements of how does domestic violence impact street violence? How does social media activity then impact violence out in the street? Uh, uh, the trauma-informed practices, all these things that you would uh, learn. We also, uh, one of the important uh, seminal classes is how do you work with the police and have a, a professional understanding with police? Because sometimes this is a concept that is not original to any of us, but we learned from uh, people out in Los Angeles again, that sometimes it's difficult for police to say, we have a relationship with these uh, ex-cons, now called outreach workers, and it's hard for them to have, we have a relationship with police because they may lose a little street cred. So they've developed this concept of a professional understanding and kind of teaching in depth, not from my perspective, but from the outreach worker's perspective and from the police perspective, what that means and then how to act accordingly when uh, situations happen. So the goal of the academy is to professionalize the field of street outreach. Uh, and if we're successful, and I think we're well on our way to being that, is these uh, individuals will get college credit. This is being taught at Kennedy King College. It's our host organization. And we're working with the chancellor and his staff to get our people college credit. Because again, the goal is not that they remain outreach workers for the rest of their lives. Some of them, we'd like to see them uh, uh, grow in their leadership at our respective organizations. But some of them, we want to just leave the practice and start a completely new life. And, and hopefully, this college credit puts them on the path, and obviously, with, with a lot of our support. But the main goal, and I know it's a long-winded answer, is to professionalize the field of street outreach work. That's a, that's a good answer. Um, Miguel, given, you know, Ready's initiative, it requires, I think, a level of collaboration that, you know, is sort of unprecedented in the city. Like, you have an outreach component, you have a jobs component, you have people who are providing CBT, all from different organizations. Talk about how, what you've learned about collaboration uh, over the last two years. That it's difficult. It's, <laughs> um, it's probably one of the hardest things to do, but the right thing to do, yeah, I'm stealing from Tanya's handbook, right? Um, sometimes the right thing to do isn't the easiest path, and, and taking that head on, it takes a lot of courage. 
um, and it takes a, a lot of passion. So uh, in the last two years, we've experienced a lot, and I think a part of the, some of the pressure points of collaboration also come where we're being evaluated by someone who's not doing the program implementation. So we're theoretically learning from ourselves as we implement as a random sort of control study does. Um, and what we learned over time is that there isn't one expert in the realm. It's sort of a coalition of thought partners that really see things from different perspectives to get to the better solution, and that has been rewarding. Um, when you, you think you know the solution to something and then there's someone else who sees it from a different perspective and then that solution was the better solution um, to go with. And collaboration also helps us better understand that, that violence is all our problem. It's not one person's problem or one community's problem. I think that we have to get to a space and time where we realize that the, the, the violence that we're living today is everybody's problem and how we respond as a community makes all the difference and it sends the message to those that are most impacted by violence. And I think what's that message through partnership? It just shows that we care. Right. Commander Cato, uh, talk about how, you know, everyday citizens can, citizens can be involved in, in making our communities safer. Well, before I answer that question, I want to touch on something Tenny spoke of. Yep. He spoke about uh, getting this young man, into, uh, flying him out, getting him into a studio to rap. Well, this young man was probably not, I shouldn't even use the pride, he was one of our biggest issues in the community when it came to violence. Uh, he, was, he, he was a shooter. He had been shot at. He had been arrested multiple times for uh, gun violence. Uh, I happened to find out that he enjoyed rapping and I had a conversation with Tenny. And Tenny asked me, well, how can we get a hold of him? I said, so we figured out how he can get a hold of him. And I'm just happy to say, since this young man has gotten involved into the rapping and when he's gone, the violence has kind of just vanished a little bit. He came back and uh, he was out in the front and he yells out, Commander, Commander, come here, listen to this. Well, it was a song, a rap that he had made when he went, I won't say the stakes, I want to expose him, but he told me, this is the, one of my rap songs so I'm listening to. I'm like, man, that's, that's pretty good. I said, uh, I thought you weren't going to say any swear words. He says, well, I'm trying. But my point is that he had this sense of uh, connection and pride that he was doing something. He took the time out to call me out because he hadn't been rapping. Believe me, he wouldn't have been saying commander because he didn't want me to see him. But he wanted me to see him because of the things that he was doing. Also, what I learned about it was the group that started forming around him when he was rapping. And that group told me that I won't have to worry about them doing any shootings. So that played a huge role in that, and that's a partnership that we are developing. We identify an issue, and we take a non-traditional means to address those issues, and they are effective. What was your question? Um, <laughs> <laughs> how, how everyday citizens can be involved in uh, reducing okay. violence in our community. <laughs> you know, I just got caught up in it because Sidney left, he's very modest, and that was a very effective tool. Now, how can everyday citizens be involved? That is the key to everything that we're doing in our community. That is the key. Because when we treat an issue as though it's invisible, that's what you will continue to get. And I say this in my community meetings. When you drive, when you take the, when you see a crowd on a corner and your block and your house is right there and you walk across the street and you walk one block down, come across the street, then come back to your house, you treated it like as though it was invisible. And I've been asking the folks in the community to say, excuse me, young man, you mind if I get by my house is right there? And they've been doing it. And these young guys have been looking at themselves like they see me. Now, don't be antagonizing. Don't make it that it turns into a conflict. Go in the house. We've been asking community members, come out on your porch and sit. Because believe it or not, these young guys and girls are ashamed of what they're doing. But again, if you go in your kitchen and watch the television in your kitchen and not in your living room, you're treating it as though it's invisible. We're asking our community members to get involved. I had a, community, I had a meeting where there was an elderly woman in the audience. She's approximately 87 years young. And she said, Commander, I'm afraid. You're asking me to go outside, and I'm afraid. I said, OK, I tell you what, don't go on your porch. I pretty much believe that your living room probably looks like mine. Your sofa is probably by the front window to the back, the windows to the back of you. And your television is probably right in front of you. 
She goes, yes. I asked her, do you own a broom? And she gave me this real, look like, she thought I was crazy. I said, yeah, do you have a broom? Well, do me a favor. Take that broom and put it beside you on the sofa. Every time you hear them in front of your house, take the broom and hit the curtain. Well, she did that a few times. She came to the next meeting. She goes, I tell you, they were outside, and I hit the curtain, and I hit it again, and I heard one of them say, that's that crazy old lady looking out the window again. <laughs> but guess what? They moved. In the summertime, I asked them again. I said, now look, if it's hot outside, and you see them out in the front, and they're making noise, and you believe they're dealing drugs, go out there and say, Young man, it's 88 degrees out here. It's hot. Would you like a cold bottle of water? Guess what? They take the bottle of water and they go stand somewhere else because, again, they're no longer invisible. We are making the community our partners in this. We cannot do this alone. It's impossible. And when we come together, working, engaging together, working together, it makes a difference. And that's one of the other reasons for the reduction in violence in the Austin area. We're not asking the community to take it on. We're asking the community for help. Excellent. Rick, can you talk to us about what more needs to be done uh, in this work? Can we clap for that? Yeah. First? Good, call, good call. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that people wanted the opportunity to, uh, yeah. to appreciate the commander. Um, what else needs to be done in this work? Um, you want me to talk from a practical sense or a philosophical sense? Because uh, there's uh, plenty, plenty to Both. talk about. Um, just, uh, just from the perspective of um, the coordinating institutions of this work, and I would include, uh, you know, Emerson Collective and Cred and Ready Chicago, MFS, through the, our partnership. Uh, to continue to think about it as a joint effort. Uh, we uh, always say this, we're, we're not doing this alone, clearly. Uh, Ready's not, and neither is any one of our partners. Uh, Commander Cato already talked about how he thinks about this, and so we think about this as an ecosystem that we are developing, that it's, it's just the pilot um, that we have developed here for the last two and a half years. It's this ecosystem that if we continue to work in earnest, in the true sense of partnership, struggling with each other's issues and problems, but st always staying at the table, that together we, we have a shot at making a difference in this uh, issue of violence in the city of Chicago. I mean, we've shown significant progress, most specifically in Austin, but there are other communities where we could also demonstrate how the violence is going down. But if we want to get to a state of um, normalized big city violence for our country. We need to get to about 197 uh, homicides per year. I, I realize not one is acceptable, but if we were just at LA's rate or New York's rate, we'd be at about 195, 97 or so. We want to get to that point. And unless, again, our philosophy is that we're doing this as a collective, as an ecosystem, we uh, stand to do what our predecessors did, and it's fail at this. And the, the partners are, are clear. It has to be community. It has to be the groups working on it. it has, pivotally, has to be the police. But then the city has to stay firm and in their investments in this initiative. So that's what we need to do, I think, from a philosophical, philosophical perspective. From a practical perspective, I think the, um, the way that we organize uh, our work uh, and our partners at Ready, we have to get even closer. Um, we have to get even more connected, like our, our connective tissue has to be intertwined in order for us to move uh, further. We started out, as I said before, with a group of uh, eight partners plus Metropolitan, so it makes it nine. Uh, we, um, today, we are close to what, 22 partners? 15. 15 partners. Um, and we will grow to the 21 or so partners, but we are 15 partners across the city of Chicago from the northeast side to the far south uh, side. Um, so we are becoming one of the big, you know, collectors or uh, collaborators in this field. But if we don't intertwine with Ready and with CRED and, and with Cure Violence, quite frankly, then uh, that we won't be 
as successful as we owe it to this community to be. Miguel, what, what would you, how would you answer that question? I think he's right on. I think I think that both the the foundation of investment and disinvestment uh, they go hand in hand. If we continue to work in segregation, I call it what it is. People call it silos, you know, but it definitely is, um, you know, the 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 way that things have been constructed before. So I'm old enough to be pre cure violence as well outreach. So understanding how fragmented it was then to the structure it is now, and I think we, what we need to do collectively is literally integrate ourselves as as that people at the table to address it from a border to border um, sort of you know um, pervasive violence. So one of the practical reasons okay. um, if from my perspective that collaboration is so important is you guys know you know we're all like I, I kind of say this thing where the goal is you and me. We know we're complex individuals with a complex set of needs to you know live the, the lives that we live daily. So if you think about the people in our neighborhoods you may be, you know, if you say you're a formerly incarcerated person, you know, there's some trauma that comes along with that. So we know you need some mental health services that are related to that. We also know if you're a returning citizen, you need housing, and housing is a challenge for that community. And then in order to sustain a job, you have to be mentally stable, you have to have a place of residence. All of those things work together. So every partner that is a part of the collaborative has to play their role with fidelity and successfully really just for that one individual. And so we can't really think about ourselves and our work and be territorial as much as we can think, hey, I have to play my role and I have to respect the role of everyone in this ecosystem to play their role for each individual to ultimately live an empowered life. I don't, I don't, I have a challenge with violence reduction and that sort of thing. I'm really always thinking about how do we get people to live empowered lives? Because when you're living an empowered lives, like you and I do, we, we don't, we're not interested in shooting. We're, we're in pursuit of some purpose, similar to the, the example that Commander Cato gave around the guy who's rapping. There's some purpose in what he's doing and some, something that gives him life that he can pursue. And that's ultimately what we want for each individual in the neighborhoods we, we're in. Um, how do we sustain the effort? Tenny, if you want to take that one. So in Chicago, there's been a very unique pattern of laying off outreach workers in the past, in the summer, when they were most needed. So one of the great things, and if you have one executive director screaming and yelling about it, it's going to be defeated. But when we all work together to stabilize the field, step, step one is, our people who are risking their lives every day out there in the field need to know that this is not a hobby, this is not now a fad of funders, that this is going to be sustained. Um, and that will require the state, the city, as well as foundation. You know, foundations sort of say, well, we want out of it after two or three years. I say, you haven't been out of the Art Institute for 150 years. This is an important issue. Jens Ludwig finished a talk from the University of Chicago at the City Club showing a few slides. One slide is, I don't know if you knew that, but New York City charges less the wealthy than Chicago in taxes and we charge more the poor. I don't know if you knew that about your city. But that's really important because we're now talking about scarcity and the deficit we're facing. The other thing he showed is closing slide at his talk. He looked since the 60s at Detroit, New York, and Chicago. And the slide was, which way Chicago? New York had a flight in the 70s and 80s when violence was out, like Chicago and like Detroit. New York took care and invested in violence reduction, and people started coming back to the city. Its population is growing. Detroit and Chicago didn't do as well, and we are losing population. If you're a capitalist, that's bad capitalism. So he asks, which way are we going to go? So we got to come over the mental barriers many people who are not in those neighborhoods, that really investment in these neighborhoods is good. It's a win for all of us. Excellent. Um, can we open it up for questions from the audience? Perfect. Go ahead. You have talked a lot about the partners in the organizations, in, in the partnership, but I don't really know what any of these particular 
partners are, or what their missions are. I wonder if you could give some examples of what they are and how their missions differ from each other or how they overlap. That's one question. And if I just ask another one, um, are any of the organizations involved with reducing the number of guns in neighborhoods and cities in the city? So I'll actually take the first one for CP4P and then you can give the ready partners that, that I don't name. So uh, there's Institute for Nonviolence Chicago. Um, really their mission is, like, actually I'll let you say your own mission if you want to. Well, when we use King we use Kingian methods of nonviolence to teach nonviolence and spread that. That is uh, building the beloved community. That's why police cannot be excluded. They're part of the beloved community. So there's UCAN uh, in North Lawndale, which is a youth serving organization. They do outreach both on the adult level and on the, um, the youth level. They have a, um, a uh, group home uh, that they run on campus and they have a, a plethora of uh, social services at that organization. Uh, and Humboldt Park is also, which is Alliance of Local Service Organizations. Their specialization is in uh, domestic violence in addition to doing uh, street outreach, both adult and youth. Um, in East Garfield Park, we have Breakthrough Urban Ministries, which comes out of a church. They have an early childhood center. They do a lot of teen programs, and they do adult street outreach. Um, in Little Village, we have New Life Centers, uh, which is a church uh, that does a lot of work in mentorship, and they do a lot of community events uh, in the Little Village neighborhood. We also have uh, Precious Blood Ministries of Restoration, which is also uh, ch uh, church-affiliated. Um, they do a lot of uh, uh, prison ministry, um, and then they do outreach in collaboration with Institute for Naima in Chicago. There's Iman, which is Inner City Muslim Action Network. Um, they have a green reentry program. They have a housing program, housing and construction program. They have a, a federally qualified health center um, on their campus, um, and they also do street outreach. And then lastly is Target Area Development Corp., which is also a church. They were one of the um, organizations that was mentioned earlier in terms of bringing clergy and uh, street involved guys together to do outreach work in there in Inglewood. You want to give a couple of the... Yeah, Harlan Alliance is in itself a 150 year old human rights organization. Its mission is probably the only organization I've worked in the last decade that I memorized the mission, uh, which is ending poverty. <laughs> That's the mission, it's really easy to remember. Um, and it does it sort of through an array of services, um, city, nationally, and, and internationally. Ready Chicago specifically um, works with uh, partners that weren't mentioned, we're um, North Lawndale Legal Christian Center, um, as well as our outreach organization within Heartland, in addition to North Lawndale Employment Network, Centers for New Horizon, and um, we have, uh, I'm missing somebody, I feel. Harlan Human Care Services, correct, thank you. Our own, our own uh, organization. Um, so we work with about seven partners in addition to the University of Chicago um, as a part of the partnership. And you know, sometimes when I teach, I share a, a, a resource. If you Google, uh, I tell them, uh, my Spanish eats my English sometimes, so I'll tell the students, do you know my friend Google? That's how my mom says it. I Google it today, right? Um, so Google it, if you, if you look for uh, uh, Ready Chicago, everything will come up. Um, and who we partner with. So one of the habits I formed uh, when I first took over this role is I stopped talking about Metropolitan Family Services in an effort to make sure we pushed our, our partners for, forward. So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Metropolitan Family Services, which um, is a 160 plus year old organization. It's a legacy organization from the Chicago Fire. Um, and we are the other partner. Um, are you... Commander Cato involved with the, um, the gun issue and getting guns off the street. Do you know any of the organizations that are involved in that? You should answer that, Megan. Yeah, I'm Miguel, sorry. Uh, Harlan Line also has a policy okay. uh, arm okay. and part of the policy and research teams. They do sort of, they're heavily in, uh, involved in policy at the state and the national level. Um, you know, guns is one of the policies in addition to everything else that they do. Um, so that's, that's one thing that Harlan does do. Well, I'll put it to you this way. I'm involved every day about trying to get guns off the street. I'm sure. And I think the main organization at this point is the Chicago Police Department. I'm, I'm happy to say at this point now we have a pro we've already recovered up to today's date 7,800 guns. Mm -hmm. And we're on a record place. We're probably going to exceed 10,000. Mm -hmm. So we're actually out there every day getting guns. Mm -hmm. 
ma'am, right here in the second row, I think. Or we have one back here? Okay. Hi. Um, I have a quick question for you guys. Um, many folks have argued that um, state government, city government, and county government have not supported interventions like these um, as opposed to uh, you know, cities like Los Angeles, cities like New York, cities like Minneapolis, Minneapolis. Would you concur with that assessment that our local government just haven't supported these prevention services as well as they should have, as well as they should have? I'm gonna take a shot first. And that's uh, part one, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I would say that um, it, while the story is more, uh, I think more complicated than that, the, the answer I would say is mostly yes, that the city and the state and Cook County government haven't uh, invested enough. But there has been investment, uh, the investment from ICJA, multiple funding lines that go to this kind of work uh, traditionally done by you know, Cure Violence. Uh, now that grant is coming through our uh, Metropolitan Family Services. Uh, the city and the Department of Health have been early investors in the Institute for Nonviolence Chicago. They continue to be investors in Communities Partnering for Peace and the efforts that we're working on, uh, and I believe we're ready also. Uh, DFSS is not quite there yet in terms of its investment in this work. In most cities, that's probably where it would sit, this kind of investment. We haven't uh, gotten there yet, but uh, certainly we're working. I know this new administration uh, has made commitments, one, to create an office uh, of uh, violence reduction, and so they've, um, they've fulfilled that, that commitment, and they have an office now and a deputy uh, mayor in charge of that office. So the story is complicated. Now, should there be more investment and in, uh, to get us to the point of uh, you know, similar percentages of LA and New York? Absolutely. And that's what the work that we're trying to do together with Ready and CRED to make sure that the state makes more investments, that the city makes more investment, and that we coordinate with the county. You, you guys choose. She permitted me to go first. She graciously permitted me to go first, which may be a problem because I talk a lot. Um, I, I want to comment and say I, all of what you have said is so important. And I think, let me just start by, and Nancy knows what I'm going to do. I was born and raised in Chicago, grew up in Inglewood. Uh, I have, and I'm saying this because a young man asked me to say it, I have three degrees, including a law degree. And he told me to say that because he said, nobody believes anybody like me came out of Inglewood. And so what you've talked about, and you remind me so much of Fred Rice, oh my God, 7th District Police became the super, first African-American superintendent of, the, of Chicago Police, because your, what you're talking about is exactly what Fred Rice did in Inglewood when I was growing up. But structurally, and I don't know, I think you talked about the segregation. Segregation and class isolation, which is documented in the book American Apartheid, has led parts of Chicago to not look like the rest of the city. So when you talk about LA, Philly, and all those great places, New York, been there, done that, there is no one Chicago. Because in Inglewood, when I was growing up, over 100,000 people lived, that's how old I am, Second largest business district to downtown Chicago. I break a fingernail over here, go across the street, I got another job. The lack of hope, there are less than 30,000 people there now. The lack of hope in that community, a young man said to me, he didn't know if he would live to be 18 because either the gangs or the police would kill him. That breaks my heart. Another young man said to me, he didn't care if he lived to be 18. So when you're talking about the lack of hope that comes from structural issues. We have got to be, and I love that you're all connected, and he's heard me, look, he said he rings there. But you've got to be connected to passionate individuals who live in the church, in the communities, like I was. There's a book called The Autobiography of Black Male Violence by Reverend Kwame John Porter, who ran Christ Methodist Church in Inglewood as part of the Inglewood School of Human, giving y'all some history, Inglewood School of Human Dignity that taught black history and white, it was called white responsibility then. That are, those are the shoulders I stand on. None of that exists in that community now. And when you talk about Detroit, Inglewood, parts of, because I think the West Side has done very well because of Stains Family Foundation and others. Inglewood is Detroit. North side of Chicago, that's upper Manhattan. Daughter been gentrified out of there five times. So you can't talk about Chicago as if it is one thing. 
It is very much structurally different, and it was intended, as the book American Apartheid will tell you, when redlining, and I couldn't get my first loan when I was going to buy my home in Inglewood, but got a bigger loan to buy in West Pullman. So we, we cannot, and I think we cannot ignore that, that people, I mean, Block Watch. My mother, I, my mother knew who I dated before anybody. That was a poor cell phone, because the Block Watch would tell you how long I was on the front porch, where I went up, and what time I went. All of that was community involvement. And that produced me and others like me. But if we don't know the history, and I mean, the, I don't mean, and, I, and you know, I've taught at Roosevelt, by the way, uh, I don't mean academic history. I mean human dignity history. And go from that to include all the structural issues that you have so, I think, amazingly talked about. But how you do it and when you do it is crucial to success. And again, my mother had a 10th grade education. So I ain't stepping on nobody's shoulders, but those in the communities who empowered me, and more importantly, gave me hope that if I wanted to be somebody, I could. What you just talked about with rapping. I mean, I knew David Boxdale. David Boxdale went to church. Christ Method, that, the head of the disciples. Jeff Fort, before he became a, whatever his name is now. See, I grew up with that. And, and I'm saying to you, unless you incorporate all of that in the history and the progress, you miss the steps that, and, that the young people who are in the midst of this now, their journey is so different from mine. So that when I go back to Inglewood to talk to them, I just have to listen, believe it or not. I can't talk. Because their journey, raised, I was raised by a single parent with, you know, with a 10th grade education. To talk about them going from that to three degrees, including a law degree, now would be absurd. But what we have to do, and you're doing it, but, but I, and I, groups like RAGE, Resident Association of Greater Inglewood, I'm going to go talk with it. These community-based groups need foundation involvement, which I was proud to do when I was at the Field Foundation, but they need spiritual involvement. People need to know and care and empower them to know that they can, they can get through this. Because otherwise, all the great work you do without the empowerment strategy and the belief strategy, because my mother used to say, if you can believe it, you can achieve it. I can't tell that to those young people. There's nothing structurally around them that endorses what I just said. And now I'll shut up. Do you have a question? Yes. Okay. Um, I did a good job by letting you go first. Um, Lieutenant Cato, I really agree with what you said, but I'm going to be really honest with you. I am the child of very famous. Uh, detectives, police officers, and FBI agents. You can see them on TV making the bus that they used to make. You have got some really, really bad police officers who should not be on the force. And I've got one chase that comes into my house when I leave, and he's on video. And I've tried so hard for the last seven years to get his name because the organizations that I'm with, he goes to my organizations. And nobody would tell me his name because they know I'm a karate chop him or something. I need to know, what do you guys do when you guys are bad? Because I know my uncle lieutenant or my father or somebody did, and I know how they caught a couple of their own people who did some bad things. And again, she, she names the point. You know, unfortunately, we do have some issues on the police department, but we're going through great strides to fix those issues, and I think we're doing a pretty good job at it right now. Pardon me? Oh, COPA doesn't work. Well, I think the, the best medicine to, to cure issues in the police department is other police officers turning in other police officers. Uh, I think we are coming to a point now where we do recognize that we have had problems and we are addressing them. We are addressing them ourselves. You know, uh, myself, for instance, you know, if I see an issue right away, this through my entire 29-year career, I identify it and I, and I report it. So those are some things that we are putting in our offices. If they do see misconduct, it's on them to report it or they become a part of the problem. Well, 
I tell you what, I know you said 67 years back, but we, we, you and I could have that conversation offline, and we could talk about whatever that issue may have been, and we can look into it together. If, can I jump in for a sec on that? We had that question today at the Institute. Uh, someone was visiting us and said, this department is so far gone. Um, I think from the perspective both of you already you spoke, you are a taxpayer and you deserve the same level of policing that someone in every part of the city gets. Now, you can try and do it with a consent decree and all those other mechanisms, and you need them. They're legal, etc. I feel our duty is working and highlighting and supporting the best commanders and the best people in the department because there's something leadership too. A leader sometimes can be isolated. They've gone too far towards reform that no one follows them. And we, in a democracy, you cannot just say these people are bad and leave them to their own devices. You isolated all the people who are doing, majority are doing good work in the department. So it is on us, in a, a democracy is a participatory sport, right? We gotta be involved, we gotta support the officers and highlight it also. We, you know, in the media often we just tell the negative stories. Who, we need to have an appetite to read positive stories, too, like a baseball league that is done now on the west side, etc. And many of us have become so cynical. I can't, we can't afford it. The people who are in the neighborhoods, like you said, can't afford for us, those of us with privilege and power, to join like we don't like them, they stink. Right? We've got to be involved and highlight the good that happens and be honest that in all our system, we had people who got rearrested, outreach too. And they haven't shunned us completely either. So this is really a long-term partnership that we work together. And I think we made that mistake with West Virginia and other parts of the country where we said, oh, we don't like them. Well, we're getting a worse form of a democracy. We gotta, everyone got to be engaged. I think this is the last question. Okay, I had two, I had two questions. The, I want to first thank you for the work that you're doing. Collaborations are so extremely important. One question is, and I think you touched on this a little bit, the shifting the narrative so that public safety and reducing violence isn't just the police department's responsibility. So how are you um, doing that more um, holistically across organization, city, you know, government, nonprofit, and so forth. And two, what opportunities are there or what um, responsibilities or ways can or do women and girls support this work and or organizations that fund organizations that support women and girls as far as helping to reduce this overall issue? Um, you want to talk about the, uh, well, so one example uh, might be District 11. So District 11 is probably, you know, is top two in terms of uh, violence. So it overlaps four communities in which we work. So that's uh, Humboldt Park, so on the western side, uh, North Lawndale, uh, West Garfield Park, and what's the, in East Garfield Park. And so one of the ways that, you know, uh, our nonprofit organizations and the police have gotten together is we meet on a regular basis to kind of talk about what's going on both across those borders uh, in terms of what we see, what the police see, and, and we try to strategize uh, on how we can reduce gun violence. And then that has led into our four organizations working on their own. And through the Peace Academy, it's brought a lot of different outreach workers across the city together in a way that's unprecedented in the city of Chicago. So that's one way. The second way is uh, in every cohort of the Peace Academy, we had, we've had women involved in the Peace Academy. So there, there are women who are outreach workers. Um, there's women who run the organizations that, uh, that are a part of our collaborative. So uh, Lori Crowder at, at also, um, one of the things they're really uh, specialized in is domestic violence. In the Peace Academy, we talk about uh, red flag relationships. A lot of that is around um, domestic relationships in, in men and women, as uh, Rick talked about. So that's something that we address in the Peace Academy. We've also had a coalition of uh, domestic violence providers come together, and we're kind of strategizing on how uh, we can incorporate that, co incorporate that more uh, into the work moving forward. Um, I don't know that we have any specific uh, female-oriented programming, at least from the macro level, but at, at the micro level, 
for each organization, you know, they may like break through in places like also, you know, have women specific programming and at uh, um, Precious Blood Ministries of Restoration, um, they do as well. And there was a second question, I think. I think the was second it? or the first question was around the narrative change. Okay. So okay. how do we there change the first narrative question. from um, what it is now to it being a, everybody's responsibility to take ownership of, is that right? To take ownership of this issue. So I think several of the speakers spoke about this concept that, you know, the violence is, uh, has to be personal to all of us because uh, the reality is it is. And if you're um, thinking about this as isolated on certain neighborhoods on the west side, not all of them, certain neighborhoods on the south side, not all of them, of course, then you are kind of removing yourself, as the commander said, from this responsibility to be a, a whole resident of the city of Chicago and to care about everybody else. So what we're doing as, uh, as an organization, and it's a collective of organizations, and through my work at the Woods Fund, it's kind of changing the narrative about this issue. And it's one, if you look at our social media presence uh, around this issue, it's, it's mostly lifting the work that's being done in communities rather than saying, we're reducing violence or we are anti-gang because we're not or anti this, we are really lifting the narrative that it is the way to build community through, uh, as uh, Brian Samuelson says, getting proximate, getting close to, the, to your neighbors and then partnering with them to build solutions where they build peace in the community, which is I think what uh, Commander Cato was uh, suggesting that we do as well. So uh, for the, at least for the nine organizations that we are currently a part of and now 15 just as of recently, if you look at our, co our collective social media presence, you'll see that, that switch in our narrative to we're not blaming anybody, we're not saying we're fixing that, we're saying look at this tremendous work that's happening in communities and if you look at the images that it's just people that look like us African American and uh, Latinx in all these communities building uh, the, the community. So we're doing that. The, but the other uh, thing is we're also working cross uh, issue with other bigger, other community, other efforts. The truth ratio hitting and transformation work has to be integrated into the work of peace building and community. So they have a whole initiative about changing the narrative about uh, race and healing in this city. So making sure that we weave into their, those initiatives, we're thinking about that uh, as, as just part of the initiative. I'll hand it over to you. Um, I know we, we're out of time, I think. Yeah, so but just as, as just uh, something the young woman said about the social constructs of, when I hear changing the narrative sometimes, that also implies the narrative was never strong. Or that also implies that black communities were never strong or Latino communities were never strong as well. I think the narrative of change has to be the stories that we tell. And I think through the work that we're doing from holistic approaches of, of addressing pervasive violence, it's sort of institutionally starting to be recognized as a collective approach to what a human needs to excel who's been impacted from disinvestment for hundreds of years, right? And uh, in, in terms of the trickle over effect. So one thing is not knowing makes us ignorant. Knowing and ignoring it makes us, what? Negligent, right? So that's how we change the narrative by one, understanding it, and then no longer continuing to ignore it. Um, so, you know, I think we need everybody's help to do that because looking away is not helping. President, can I have one last word, <laughs> tiny and short? You got three more hours, Tiny. No, no. <laughs> I wanted to address uh, the lady from Englewood. Uh, we describe programs, so these are short panels, so we have less than an hour. I want to assure you, because I think you deserve that, that we start and end our day with passion and love. We say, when I, we speak to our participants, we end the day telling them we love you, and they say back we love you. All those services are in a way an excuse to love and have a connection, and everyone here, and I know them, and a lot of our partners, the passion is driving through the neighborhood sometimes late at night when you come back from the hospital is depressing. We get treatment ourselves, just, you know, we're part of this reality. We just sort of talk about the work we do, but it starts with love and engagement. Nice. Well, what an inspiring and a difficult conversation. Uh, first of all, thank you, Vaughn, Miguel, Rick, Ernest, and Tenny for this discussion. 
and the good work that every one of you does every single day with your organization in our community. We know we can't continue to have a vibrant city of Chicago without the work being done in every single neighborhood. Okay. Uh, and I also want to thank Nancy Stevenson, as well as your son, and the Adlai Stevenson Center for Democracy for the tireless work that you do to support on the ground our democracy and nonviolence in our neighborhoods. So thank you so much for that. Uh, four years ago, uh, Trustee Smith and I had a conversation, and Jill Wallowitz was there as well, regarding funding the, uh, the American Dream Reconsidered uh, Conference. And we said we will have difficult conversations because American Dream has different meanings for different people in the different neighborhoods and in our community. And that was our pledge that we would work together to bring those discussions to us. Today brought it home to me um, in terms of what we're doing in Chicago. Allow me to mention a couple of anecdotes. Uh, the typical response of violence is, in not, is not in my neighborhood, so why do I care? Well, uh, as a president of this university, I have to tell you that our students come from those neighborhoods. We have a significant number of first-generation college students from the south side and the west side. And the stories that they tell me and our colleagues and our faculty are absolutely mind-boggling. Okay. Allow me to share that just one anecdote. Uh, this young woman was telling me that, you know, last week, this happened a year or so ago, that she was stopped, uh, she was in a car, with some friends, and it was you know, late afternoon, early evening, and she was at a stoplight on the south side, and then suddenly six police cars converged, and multiple, maybe a dozen, police officers walked out with drawn guns. And you know, she said, I was shaking, I couldn't breathe, you know, I brought my window down, and you know, after some conversation and so forth, it was a mistake. Somebody else had done something. And uh, she said, the police officer, the commander in charge, mentioned that you were caught in, uh, in the wrong uh, part of the town in the wrong car. Okay? And she said, first of all, I live here, so that I have no choice. And she said, and I said, you know, what kind of car were you driving? She said, well, I have a beat up old Chevy Impala. Okay. And then she jokingly said, now I've got a Subaru. <laughs> All right. So what I'm saying to you, this was funny at the moment as well, but that was traumatic to her. Unfortunately, she was fine and her friends were fine in the car, but it was a daily life that she had to go through to make her way to the university so that we can have a safe place and be in the audience and hear from you and the community work that is going on to make her community a safer place. Also, I want to go back just to, uh, to the 1980s. I lived in Boston, and I opened the TV channel, whatever, local news, and um, this young reporter was following, as she put it, a bullet. And she said, you know, somebody was just shot, a young man, and uh, I'm going to follow what happens to this person. And just like, like the telethons, on the right side of the screen, there was a running dollar sign that showed the cost of response, the cost of taking the ambulance to the emergency room, so forth and so on. He was fine. Two days later, after surgery, he was let go. And then this ticker stopped at $250,000, okay? And this was in the 80s, $250,000 for one bullet. So part of our discussion as we talk about nonviolence and so forth, besides, and maybe perhaps the answer to not in my neighborhood is, but look at the cost. Look at how much an organization like Blue Cross and Blue Shield 
has of the percentage of the health care that goes into all of us, keeping us all healthy, has to go towards curing and getting that one person back on his feet and into the community. And then tens of thousands of shootings and so forth. So I say that because uh, we need to find the response and exactly the type of work you're doing in every neighborhood, getting to know the parents, getting to know the family members, and yes, absolutely, walking up to that young man and calling him by his first name. Jimmy, I know who you are. Okay, That's how we started at every stage. So anyway, that is my lecture for today. <laughs> uh, you will be receiving one credit, college credit for that. So again, thank you so much for all of you being in the audience today. Now, if you stick around until 5 p.m., we do have this evening a panel titled Activism and Grassroots Change that is very, very informative. So thank you again for all of you for coming. Thank you.